Hi, my name is Melanie Benish, and I am the legislative attorney here at the Environmental Working Group. And today I want to talk to you about the EPA's big announcement that they are going to designate two of the toxic forever chemicals known as PFAS, PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Liability and Compensation Act, or CERCLA, which you may know as the Federal Superfund Law. And this is a really big deal because it's going to give regulators like the EPA and states and also communities who have been impacted by contamination from these forever chemicals, a new set of tools to really jumpstart the cleanup process and try and get those dangerous chemicals out of their water, out of their soils, um, and, and out of their communities. And the need to clean up PFAS contamination has never been more urgent. This month, the EPA concluded that PFOA and PFOS, which have been previously linked to cancer and other health harms like reproductive harms and immune effects, are far more toxic than previously thought, um, it, orders of magnitude more toxic than previous thought. And these are the two PFAS that the EPA is proposing to regulate under CERCLA. And so I'm gonna tell you about the practical implications of this designation and how it's gonna give the EPA and, to, and communities that extra set of tools that I talked about. Um, but first I do wanna talk a little bit about what this designation won't do because there has been some confusion. So if designated as hazardous substances, PFOA and PFOS will, will not be banned and manufacturers will not have to stop using those PFAS or other PFAS in their products. And so um, let me repeat that just so that it's really clear. Hazardous substance designation under CERCLA or uh, the Superfund law, as you might know it, is not a ban. It is not a ban. CERCLA regulates cleanup of chemicals. So it's really the law that comes into play once a chemical has been released into the environment, people have been exposed to the environment, but it doesn't regulate the use of that chemical. There are other environmental laws like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act um, and, and the Toxic Substances Control Act that are focused on the ongoing uses of a particular chemical, but not CERCLA. CERCLA is a cleanup statute. Uh, and, and so instead, what CERCLA does is it governs the cleanup of sites contaminated by the release of these hazardous substances. And then it also allows the EPA to recover costs from, uh, from the polluters that are responsible for, those, for that pollution. And so it allows the EPA to clean up. And it also, if EPA is expending resources and some taxpayer money to do that cleanup, then EPA can take back some of those costs. And over the more than 40 year history of Superfund, designating a chemical as a hazardous substance has actually rarely led to manufacturers stopping to use it. In fact, CERCLA hazardous substances are used by manufacturers every day and often in large quantities. So right now there are roughly 800 different substances on the CERCLA hazardous substance list or the Superfund hazardous substance list and almost 700 of those chemicals have been on that list for more than 40 years, uh, since 1980 when the law first passed. And EWG did an analysis in 2019, a couple of years ago, and we found that at least three quarters, around 600 of those chemicals, are still in active use, most likely. And, and moreover, nearly half of those CERCLA hazardous substances, or 339 of them, were not only still in use, but were likely produced in large quantities. In fact, uh, sulfuric acid is a good example. This is one of the most produced and most widely used chemicals in the world. And it was on that original list. It has been a circle hazardous substance for more than 40 years. Um, but manufacturers have found a way to continue using it, continue using it in large quantities without releasing significant amounts into the environment or doing something that would trigger that hazardous substance cleanup. 
Um, but some members of Congress don't seem to understand this. They have been recycling industry talking points, and they have falsely claimed that designating PFOA and PFOS or any other PFAS chemical as a hazardous substance that it would ground airplanes, it would end the use of life-saving heart stents and infants and other people, um, and it, it would require us to throw off uh, our, our personal protective equipment, the surgical masks that we have all been wearing for the last two years. Um, so, for example, in one hearing, a legislator warned that labeling all PFAS as hazardous would provide a direct threat to FDA-approved drugs and devices because PFAS is used in some of those drugs and devices, um, which could lead to lives lost. At the same hearing, another legislator said that designating PFAS as a hazardous substance was proposing to end the use of masks because many of them contain PFAS. And I just want to say that this is nonsense. It's simply not true. Um, just as circle hazardous substances continue to be used by many industries, even after they are designated, a lot of circle hazardous substances are also used in the medical field. Ethylene oxide is one example. It's used to sterilize medical equipment. Uh, a couple of other examples, xylene, toluene, and formaldehyde uh, are all used to preserve tissue specimens. Uh, mercury can be used in dental amalgam fillings. And so um, this is just a number of examples where hazardous substances have been designated, um, but it has not created a de facto ban on the, on the use. And so, um, but, but here's actually the most important reason that designating PFOA and PFOS, again, those two most notorious PFAS forever chemicals, here's the most important reason why designating those PFAS as hazardous substances would not be a ban. PFOA and PFOS have already largely been abandoned by industry because of a 2006 stewardship agreement that the major manufacturers of those chemicals signed with the EPA. And so you can't create a de facto ban of chemicals that have already been phased out. And so this is just another example of how saying that this is going to create a ban, that it's going to get rid of medical devices and pharmaceuticals that people rely on, um, it's just not true. It's simply not true. But here's what EPA uh, is proposing to do and why that's important. So the Superfund law distinguishes between chemicals that have been designated as hazardous substances, as the EPA is proposing to do for PFOA and PFOS, those two PFAS chemicals, and chemicals that are just considered pollutants or contaminants. And so under the current law, prior to the EPA announcement, PFAS chemicals are considered pollutants or contaminants, but not hazardous substances. And that difference, it really limits the power of the EPA and states and communities to clean up PFAS pollution. Um, so the first difference is by making something a hazardous substance designation, you create a reporting requirement for any time you release that substance over a certain threshold. And when you release over that certain threshold, after you report, it triggers an investigation uh, regulators will look into that release into the air, land, or water that's exceeding that threshold um, and, and determine whether or not they needs to, there needs to be a cleanup. By contrast, when something is just a pollutant or a contaminant, you have to show that there is an eminent and substantial danger, that's the legal test, to public health before the site can be investigated and cleaned up. And so that is just, uh, from a legal perspective, a much higher bar to meet than simply being able to show that you have a released amount over the threshold that has been established for reporting. And then second, even when the EPA can meet that high bar, that imminent and substantial danger, uh, the EPA's actions that they can take in response to that are, are much more limited. And perhaps most significantly, is the EPA's ability to use its own funding to initiate a cleanup. Sometimes you have a site and it's not easy to immediately identify who the responsible parties or polluters are, um, or there's just a really urgent need to clean up. And so in that case, what the EPA may do is take some money from the Superfund, um, as it's called, and, and initiate that cleanup. And then EPA can identify the polluters, the responsible parties, and sue them to recover some of their costs. 
Uh, but you can only do that if something is a hazardous substance. You can't do it with just a pollutant or contaminant. Um, and then third, practically speaking, because the Superfund program has limited resources, um, as do many EPA programs, um, it tends to prioritize hazardous substances, in part because it has those additional mechanisms um, and, and things that they can do. A another difference, EPA can order a cleanup for a hazardous substance, which they can't do for something that's just a pollutant or contaminant. And so um, giving EPA more power um, will also allow them to shift more resources to address forever chemicals um, at existing and at new Superfund sites. Um, and then finally, the Department of Defense is a major PFAS polluter because for more than 50 years, it used a special kind of firefighting foam um, that was laden with PFAS and then would release a lot of that foam. And that foam got into the ground and got into the drinking water and contaminated um, hundreds of communities. Uh, but despite this direct connection to PFAS contamination, the Department of Defense has really been dragging its feet in cleaning up those contaminated sites. And so the section of the Superfund law that focuses on federal actors like the Department of Defense um, is largely focused on hazardous substances. And so creating this hazardous substance designation will then make it easier for those communities that have been polluted by the Department of Defense uh, to hold the DOD accountable and for the EPA to hold the DOD accountable because of their role in polluting so many communities. And so just to summarize, uh, is hazardous substance designation a ban? No. But will it encourage polluters to think twice before releasing PFAS into the environment? Yes. Will it give the EPA, state regulators, and communities new tools to try and address the existing cleanup that needs to happen? Yes, for sure. And that's a great thing. And so we are really excited about this announcement today. This is a proposed rule. Hopefully we will see a final rule by next summer. Um, and then the communities will finally see some relief and polluters who have been getting away with this for a long time will finally be held accountable. And so thank you for taking the time to listen to uh, my explainer today of the Superfund hazardous designation for PFOA and PFOS. And uh, we uh, look forward to continuing to share more information and resources with you about this issue as we learn more. Thank you.